I'm going to preach to you a sermon that you probably haven't heard before. How are you going to connect this to Advent? But I'm going to put a disclaimer out there at the moment that if there are people who are not aware of reproduction, the ladies of the evening, and uh, other forms of procreation, uh, this may come up, and if you want to shield ears or have them leave the room if you're watching online, <laughs> uh, just giving you a heads up, that will be part of some of the sermon today. Uh, I'd like to open up with the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram. Heavenly Father, as we look at these words, as we look at these scriptures, while they may just be names, we understand some of the history that's about them. And we ask for your blessing on this service today. May our spirit and your spirit commune together. May your word speak to our soul. May we hear your words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You'll also notice scripture up there that is in Genesis chapter 38. And our focus today is going to be on the woman named Tamar, or Tamar, depends on your pronunciation. And I'd like to remind you that when you read, especially some of the Old Testament, there is a warning in the Bible. It is full of dirty laundry, and there will be skeletons in the closets. As we look at the genealogy of Jesus, as we go along chapter 1, verse 3, we notice a woman is mentioned. And again, her name is Tamar. Tamar. This is just an artist renditioning. She could have looked like him. I just happened to like, like that image there. So, in Genesis chapter 38, I'm going to give you a loose paraphrase of what's going on. And what we see is there's a man named Judah. Judah was the son of Joseph. And if we remember, um, excuse me, not Joseph, he was the brother of Joseph. He was the son of Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They then have this issue where they're going to um, Egypt and they sell one of the brothers into slavery. There are a couple older brothers who lose the possibility of being in the lineage of Jesus. And we can talk about that another time. But Judah screws up. And we see in Genesis there's this long period of time where Jesus is kind of foreshadowed. But in Judah's life, we see a life of here, a drop off in the stock market, here he hits rock bottom, and then through his, we're, we're going to discuss how he's related to Tamar, he then has redemption and is able to be brought back and he's able to save his brothers, his families, and there are good things that happen. But he had three sons. Ur, Onan, and Seth. Now it's interesting, Ur marries Tamar. And he, his name spelled backwards, is the Hebrew for evil, R-E, right? And so it says very clearly that he's married to Tamar, he does evil in the sight of God, he's a wicked man, And he dies. Okay? So, here we have a woman named Tamar who is married to a man named Ur who then dies. And I need you to understand the concept of what's called the kinsman redeemer. Some of you can read that, some of you can't. Sorry about that. But basically, in the Israelite tradition, if a man was married and does not have any children, and he dies, it is his brother's responsibility to marry, have children with, 
and continue the brother's lineage. So Judah goes over to Tamar and says, you are now going to marry Onan. Now this guy here does an interesting thing. He says to himself, if I marry her and have children for my brother, then my inheritance gets split between my kids and his kids. Right now, because he died and didn't have any heir, all that comes to me, the next firstborn, the next in line. So every time he slept with her, made love with her, had sex, and whatever words you want to put there, he used the old pull-out method, as they call it. And the Bible says he spilled his seed on the floor. He did what is detestable in the eyes of the Lord. And people say, okay, maybe that's a bad way for intercourse. Don't, don't, can't pull out. And so you have a lot of people who, well, we can't do that, that is sin, and then we have children out of wedlock. I shouldn't have done it in the first place. No, what was detestable was that he was using her as an object of sexual gratification, but would not fulfill her rights and her need for a child. And so by him not putting his seed inside of her, she could not have children, and therefore she could not follow through with what was expected of her. And so he does evil in the eyes of God, and now he goes. Judah, he's a little concerned now. He's had two sons married to the same woman and both died. What's going on? So obviously, again, the kinsman redeemer, the, the brother who's going to continue the line, is his next son. And he says, oh man, I don't want to have no children. So he tells her, go and live with your dad. Basically, you're going to be disgraced, but we're going to send you back as a widow. And when my son gets old enough, I'll call you, and you can uh, marry him and have children and, and fulfill your legal rights. Word gets around. That as she moves to her father's town in Timna, he's of age. But he ain't coming. She has been abandoned. Judah was thinking, I'm not going to send her to him. Nope, it's, it's done. And he decided to go other ways. His wife ends up dying. And he has to do a business transaction, so he's going up in the region in which Tamar is living. And while she's there, she hears about this. So she takes off her veil of mourning, and she moves to the veil of seduction. What do I mean by this? This woman, who is a widow, who was his daughter-in-law, goes and dresses as a prostitute. Now they have what's called the prostitutes of the shrine. And th again, this was before Exodus. This was before the Ten Commandments. This was before all the stuff that we have in the Code of Life Bible. Everything's word of mouth and a lot of things are mixed from the regions around them. And so they had these shrines around that were to various things and there would be these women who it was their purpose was to have sex with men who were traveling there and paying homage to the shrine. So if they gave $20, they got this. If they gave $50, they got that. Depends on how many women. It was a, it was a very interesting system. And so she goes out and she dresses herself in the veil of seduction. She became, she becomes a lady of the evening. She is a prostitute. Now he goes by, a widow, a, a widower now, cruising along, and he sees her. And I don't know if she flashed her nose, showed some ankle, not really sure, but all of a sudden he said, hmm, I'm a newly single man. I might take her up on her offer. 
And so he's enthralled, and they begin the, the passion, and she stops right before things go. She says, whoa, 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 whoa. What am I getting out of all this? And he said, oh, I'll, 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 I'll send my servant to go get a goat. I'll bring uh, a new goat, and I'll, I'll bring him to you, and, and you can do what you want. Wow. Sell your body for a goat. And, and, and she says, where is this goat? Well, I, I don't have it. She says, well, I'm not giving it up if you aren't going to produce something for me. So give me your staff, your belt with your signet ring on it, and when and then when you bring the goat, I'll make the exchange. He said, okay, because again, he's in the throes of passion. He's going to say whatever he wants to get to the deed. And so he goes, and he does whatever he does with the prostitute. We don't really know. But we do know that he ends up impregnating her. So whatever they did, they continued to do until she was pregnant. Anyway, after he did the deed, he left. She then goes back home. She slops her clothing. She puts back on her veil of mourning. Never once did the father-in-law come and check on her. He might have figured that out had he gone and visited her. No, nope. he went through, but he didn't see her. So we know he had no intention of bringing her to his, own, his next son in line. He then sends his servant to go send the goat up to this woman that he met on the way. And they get there, and there's no woman. So the guy takes the goat back and says, well, she wasn't there. And in fact, he asked around, and they said, this isn't a red light district. There, there, there's no women here who are ladies of the evening. There is no, what are you talking about? No, there are no temple shrines here for women. No. So the man went back and he told Judah, his, his master, and Judah said, well, she's not there. Her loss. A couple months later, word gets to him that Tamar, his daughter-in-law is pregnant. Oh, no! Burn her! How dare she cheat and, and not wait for my youngest son? Oh, no, 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 no. So he goes and he gets a posse out and they're going to just burn her for this infidelity. And before it happens, she takes out his staff, his ring, his robe, and this is basically the equivalent of his driver's license, social security number, and his credit card. Alright, if you have those, you know who that person is. I got find your wallet. Is this you? Okay, so she brings that out. She says, the man who impregnated me owns this. I mean, Judah was gone. He's like, ah, and we wonder, was she a sinner? Or was she a hero? Because this woman was wrong. And one of the themes that we can see in the, in the story of um, Tamar, and one of the reasons why we can see she's in the genealogy of Jesus, because even though these skeletons are coming out of the closet, we find that she is a woman who had dealt with injustice. This woman had a right to have children to bring on to the offspring so the line would continue, and she was denied. She did what she could, but she was denied. When Judah saw what she had done, he basically said, oh my goodness, she is much more righteous than I am. And he basically allowed her to have kids, didn't burn her, didn't force an abortion. He realized what happened. When the children were born, they were actually twins. And one, as they were being born, one twin was coming out, his hand came out first, and the nursemaid was like, oh! Tie a little red rope on that so we know who the firstborn was. And they go to try to get the child out. And the one who was inside pulled it back. And said, not today, Satan. Maybe not Satan. Pulled the child back and, and came out next. And so we see the child called uh, Perez. 
That was, uh, Perez is the next in line in the lineage of Jesus, which mainly, basically means to push forth, to fight for yours, to get out. And so here Perez is saying, uh uh-uh, uh, you're not going to deny me. And he pushed himself out, and he became the firstborn, even though his brother put his hand out first. So just because you raised the fist doesn't mean that you're first. Okay, more little pieces here. Oh, wow, this is a a little bit of scandal going on. And one of the things that we can look at in today's scene is that when we have injustice, we also need to understand that there is hope. But what do you mean by that, Pastor Matthew? Well, well, let's look what we can learn from tomorrow itself. It takes courage and creativity to stand up for yourself. One of the lessons you can learn today is sometimes you need to be courageous and you also need to be creative. Make the law work for you. Do the things that are needed to make sure that you can get justice. At no time here did she do anything illegal. Now again, prostitution was legal back then. There were, there were rules, there were a lot of things. Basically, she was promised, she was denied, and she said, mm-hmm. We can also see that not only does it take creativity, but God is trustworthy. And if you reread the story of Judah, you'll understand that Judah himself was basically the next in line. Because again, the older brothers lost their lineage rights. And so Judah's the guy to be in connection to the Savior, the line of David. But he was screwing up. He sold his brother. He put this brother off. And Simeon got in trouble. Read, read his story. Judah's got a fascinating, fascinating thing. And as you look at his life, he's up here, he drops down, and when Tamar comes in, his life comes back on track. Because she smacked him upside the head with the truth. Anybody ever need to get smacked with the truth from time to time? And when he heard the truth, it set him free. And he was able to go back up and he lived a better life and he fought for his family and he got them to go back into Egypt to get the grain that was needed so that they could survive and the family moved and they were reunited with Joseph and Benjamin was connected. There were all these positive things that happened in his life so their family could endure. But we can also know, again, this is not just about him, but when we look at her, even when we act righteously, other people may misunderstand us. And there are many times in your life when you probably have done something right that people looked at you and said, what? Why are you doing that? And in fact, Jesus himself says, the wise things of people, God says is foolish. And the things that people say, that's dumb. God says is good. And what we see here is we see people like David becoming a king. We see time and time again Jesus drawing the lowly people, drawing them to himself and saying, you've got great potential. God looks at each of us while we were still sinners, and yet he died for us. And while he did that, this death and then resurrection came not because of what we did, Not something that was wise in our eyes. It seemed dumb. Why would anybody die for somebody else? And yet he does. She was a respected mother, the nation of Israel. Tamar's extraordinary efforts to continue Judah's line. We see this uh, is mentioned in Chronicles. We see it in uh, Ruth and then also in Matthew. She's mentioned. And so I need us to focus on that when there is injustice, there can only be perseverance through hope. If you have been wrong, you will either retreat into yourself and things will go from bad to worse, 
or you will find a way to have hope. And that's what's going to get you through. It took her a little while. This did not happen overnight. This did not happen in the course of a couple weeks or months, not even a couple of years. This was a little, a long process. And sometimes we get frustrated when the results aren't now. And as a result, we sometimes have our faith shaken. Sometimes things take years, decades. We don't understand it all the time. But if you have been a person like Tamar who has suffered injustice, if you've had a boss who's been overbearing, if you've had family members that just they take advantage of you, if you've got people in your life who have messed you up, you matter to God. No matter what you have done, you still matter to God. And I want you to make sure you can take that message. And perhaps you, you haven't screwed that, you haven't been that bad. Maybe you were Judah and you were doing the screw. But you can take this message of hope to the people who you know are struggling. And you can remind them that they matter to God. And the only way that people can understand that they truly matter to, to God is if they have hope. As we lit that candle today, the first Sunday of Advent, as we remind ourselves this is the candle of hope, the prophecy, this is what is to come. We have been given the promise of eternal life. We have been given the promise of heaven. We have been given the promise of an eternity with Jesus. And we understand that the definition of love is God. God is love. And if indeed we see that, if indeed we understand that, if indeed we know that, then not only are we able to go to the next level, but we are able to endure the injustices that come upon us. Do I wish injustice on any of you? No. Do I wish that you have to have an adulterous affair with a relative? No. Do I wish that people mess you up? No. I mean, you kind of get where I'm going with this. But I do wish that you can have hope in the face of injustice. And you will truly never realize that hope if you do not take it through Jesus Christ. Because all other things are fleeting. All other things will disappoint you. And no matter what else you place your hope in, you will find that it will be for naught if indeed you miss out on the blessings of God. So again, we looked at Tamar today. Sorry. And we wanted to know that. Um, I guess I missed. Uh, we just focus on that. So anyway, tomorrow the thing was injustice. Hope is what keeps us through. And as you work your way through life, let's see if we can grasp onto this hope, even in the face of injustice. Every week for the month of uh, for the Advent series, just as a heads up, I'll be speaking about the different women in the lineage of Jesus. And we are going to find plenty, plenty of skeletons. Plenty of dirty laundry, and plenty of things we wonder where a sermon can come from. But Jesus came from this lineage. Jesus redeemed this lineage. And regardless of what your past might have been, we can have hope through Christ. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I ask that you would give each person hope who is here today. That you would work in their life, that you would work through their life. That regardless of the injustices that they have endured, regardless of the things in which they have experienced, it has not beaten the hope out of them. And gracious God, for those of us who are struggling with hope, for those of us who just, I, I can't hold on, God. I ask that your spirit would be present on us in a special way. I ask that the body, who is the believers, who are the church, would surround one another and lift one another up. So that in the face of injustice, there can be hope. And we know that you hear our prayers. 
may we also hear your responses. Father, I ask that you would bless the givers, and I ask that you would bless the gift. May both be used to advance your kingdom. May lives be changed. May your kingdom be advanced. May our doors continue to remain open as long as we have a purpose in this community. I ask for your blessings on us today. In Jesus' name, amen.